perfect. Okay. Uh, got it. For instance, okay, here we go. For instance, you can see down here, um, rip currents are coming off and kind of transporting stuff away from the coast, where you can see quite complex um, dynamics here around headlands. But what I'm going to talk today to you about is those kind of structures. I'm not sure if you can see them online as well. These are the surface expressions of incoming large scale internal waves, actually. Okay. Um, there's a couple of words about the project. Um, so this was quite a large project with many project partners involved, a couple of which you can see up here. Um, and it was quite nice because <clears throat> um, everybody decided to come together to put all the assets in one basket, basically, to come up with this really nice um, experiment here of the coast of California. Okay where lots of assets were in the water kind of to, to measure over two months period in, in 2017 and fall, all kind of different aspects of the inner shelf there. So for instance, we had um, on the order of about 100 moorings with density and velocity, most of them. We had three uh, larger research vessels and four small boats in operation at the same time. We have two airplanes that kind of um, alternative, I mean, alternatingly observe the area. We have four land based radar stations. And we also use satellite and drift data action. So it was lots of information at the same time. It's really nice. Um, our particular contribution was to <clears throat> come up with a way to quantify turbulence on the shelf, to measure it actually. And to this end, to realize this, we developed a new turbulence measurement device that we call Gusty. And it's quite small. It's about, I don't know, 40, 50 centimeters long. And it's measuring both microstructure temperature and microstructure velocity. And it's measuring microstructure velocity with a P2, which is kind of quite new, uh, at least in water it is. But it also measures lots of other aspects. The nice thing about it is it can um, measure up to 45 days continuously, really high resolution. So it's kind of ideal for this kind of experiment. And then we tried out a lot of different um, deployment techniques for this instrument. For instance, we had it attached to all kind of different chip-based platforms, for instance, like Toad CTDs or vertical profilers or bow chains, okay? There were also deployment modes where we had it on bottom landers. But the most important and the one that I'm going to use today the most in terms of for the talk is deployments on mooring chains, okay? Overall, we, um, we constructed 80 of those instruments and had almost all of them in the water at the same time. So we get a really nice overview about what's happening in terms of turbulence all across the shell. Okay. Okay. Um, just a few words about the study site. So kind of approaching it from above here. This is a satellite image of the broader area. So we are off the coast of California. This is the Santa Barbara Channel down here. So Los Angeles would be around about there. Okay. And we are measuring up here. And it's kind of Quite an interesting region because you have the cold California current coming down here, which is really cold and green rich, and it's mixing with the um, Southern California bite water here, which is way warmer. So you have lots of mesoscale and submesoscale activity in this region. And also, what the color shows you is, I think, um, chlorophyll concentrations or something like that. So it's um, you can see it's a really highly productive area as well, right? So there's lots of things going on there, also in terms of bio. Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, so 
<clears throat> okay, this was a satellite image, right? So we, if we zoom a little bit closer, we can look at data from the airplanes that we use. This is um, sea surface temperature um, with infrared cameras. And you can see lots of structure here already. For instance, look here, maybe I can show this. Um, look here, you can see the, the ship that we use to measure, for instance, and you see also in the background, it's cold wake. So it's kind of steering up the water, right? But you also see this really long structures here. And these are the surface expressions of the incoming nonlinear internal waves. Okay? And if you would be standing on the ship, for instance, uh, you could also see those because they form really long foam lines that span all the way up to the horizon here. Okay? It's due to the fact that they have surface convergence. So all kind of stuff collects there. And those fronts travel over a couple of hours um, onto the shelf. And we can see this, for instance, also from uh, radar data. This is the land-based radar stations that you see here. This is across about 40 kilometers or so. So it spans quite a large area, okay? And I have a nice um, video here. You can see the small Wir reden jetzt noch. Das muss ja nicht joinen, das Ding nach vorne. Mach einfach den Sound in Windows aus. Ich hoffe, jeder kann mich jetzt hören. Das ist jetzt ein Video, was wir sehen von den, von den Radarschätzen. Okay? Wir sehen Schiffe hin und her springen, aber wir sehen auch diese lange Front hier rein. Okay? Lass uns mal abspielen. Und das funktioniert. Ja, man kann sehen, wie die reinkommen. Und die Switch geht ja. Ah, sorry. Okay. Uh, so this big front that's coming in, that's kind of an internal white front, and it's also it looks really close to you. Um, we can go back there. So it's coming in, but it's also spinning out higher frequency waves in the front. There's even the next one coming in back here. Okay, so it's a really large scale coherent things that are kind of showing across the shelf. Okay? That's the point. Um, all right. Um, so that's the view from above, but we can also look at this whole thing internally. If you look at all those nice moons, you can actually look what's happening inside the water column as well. Okay? And so this is the whole array. So we have lots of moorings there. I'm just picking out a couple of them. And it's quite a complex figure. So I try to take my time to walk us through this. Um, I picked out a couple of those moorings where you see the velocity vertically resolved where blue is close to the bottom and red close to the surface. And you also see the temperature, the vertical temperature, temperature structure, which is Equal density because salinity is not very important at this place. Mm. Vertically resolved. 
but since yet it's 100 meter mooring over a depth of 100 meters. And for those two moorings here, which are over a water column depth of about 50 meters. Okay. What you also see is those pink circles here, and that tells you something about the depth integrated dissipation that you see from our dissipation measurement. So, how much energy gets dissipated. And then down here, I have a clock. So, see like the tidal signal, but also what's happening with the wind, you know. So, this is a video as well. Um, so, you can see out here, there's those internal waves coming in pretty large scale, right? So, many tens of meters in terms of amplitude. For instance, let's look at one particular one. For instance, look at this guy coming in, but once it reaches the 50 meter out of bar, it's really distorted already. It has really big amplitude. You can see this coming in regularly. For instance, there's another one coming in, okay? And here you can see it approaching the 50 meter. And once it hit, boom, you see this really strong dissipation signal, right? So lots of the dissipation you see in the water column seems to be really associated to this incoming showing the tunnel waves. Okay, these are the all coming. Well, you can see this really strong dissipation signal there with it. Um we're now slowly approaching a strong air wind here. Okay. Um up here is some surface press. And you can see that uh we have now this really strong wind coming from the northwest. Okay, and it sets up, it's just a cycle of this geostrophic current along the coast. But what it also does, it's more important for our here, it's cooling down the upper surface, right? So decreasing stratification across the water column. You can see that the colors became very lighter in terms of temperature. And this has the consequence, namely that the amplitude of this incoming tunnel waves become way bigger, right? You can see that even out here at 100 meters there. We spend almost the entire water column. Okay. Um, yeah, we can have an example. Right, you can see this really large scale that's going to waste the Okay. Um, that's all nice and good. Okay. Um, Maybe we can look at this in a little more detail. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, so Yeah, sorry about it. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, here we go. Okay, so we had this two months measurement right here across the coast. And it's just some timeline up here. This is spent over the entire two months, and we can see it in the upper panel stratification, and in the lower panel, the amount of internal tidal energy, so the internal wave energy that is fluxed into the region. Measured in terms of the internal tidal energy flux here at that station, at the outermost MS100 station. Okay. And I'm just a little showing good to you because show that the, the uh, environmental condition changed quite a lot over the over the experiment. So it's really strong certification period in the beginning with fairly little um, energy flux coming in. And I want to show you some data from this, and then I want to Contrasted with a situation where we have quite little stratification, but a lot of energy coming in. Okay. And over here, you see the vertical profiles of um, stratification of n squared for this red, the weaker stratification period. See, it's more homogeneous across the water column. 
and we have kind of a more picnic line situation for this initial stronger certification theory. Um, I'm just highlighting a couple of moorings here. This is the MS100, the deeper mooring. And I'm showing you here just data over this initial stronger certification theory. Then uh, MS100, then one mooring at 50 meters, one mooring at 40 meters, and one mooring at 25 meters. And what this image shows you in black, you see um, the ice sun, so also isotopic, if you like. You can already see like a jumping line. Right? So this is the expression of the atomic waves that are coming in. And the background shows you the color shows you the orange tall velocity component. So you can really see like most of this incoming tunnel waves are below one where you have um, the surface velocity is going in the opposite direction than the bottom velocity. Okay. Also, and that's kind of what was our contribution to this measurement. You can see this mutation as well. And it's those um, Purple circles that you can see here. They kind of indicate the strength of this mutation rate that we measure at all these different depths as well. Okay. And also, what's dissipated in the button boundary there are depicted by that line. Okay. So you can see like strong peaks in dissipation kind of associated to this incoming wave. Okay, once again, this is the strongly stratified kind of less energetic period. So let's look at the more energetic, less stratified period. Okay. That's what I show you here. So you can see already immediately that the velocities are way stronger, right? So there's way more energy coming in. But also the amplitude of those isotherms becomes way stronger, and you see way more uh, dissipation going on. Most of which seems to be associated, at least at first glance, to those incoming internal tides. Okay. All right, and then you can also calculate. Um, uh, mean dissipation profiles that what you see here, contrasting this period in red to this period in blue, and you can see that in general we have more dissipation going on in the water color in this more energetic period. Okay, um, so apparently a lot of the dissipation we see seems to be associated to this incoming tunnel waves. So I wanted to understand this a little bit more. So what I did was. Um, I calculated the energy flux, the orange energy flux of the internal waves or the internal tides, if you like, um, for each of those moorings. Okay. And then I plotted over the distance, here's the x axis, the distance from the 100 meter isobars. Okay. So this single mooring that we have out here at 100 meters would be sitting right there. Okay. And then all these other moorings are all these other symbols that we see here, okay, going further and shore. So this is going on shore basically from the one that we did the IP bars. And up here you see the uh, energy flux of the internal tide. You can see it starts out on average, that's the two months average, okay, at about 100 watts per meter. And it's decreasing really rapidly across the shelf. By almost two orders of magnitude once we go inshore. So apparently, most of the energy is really lost within this range that we kind of observed here of the internal tide. Okay. So you can kind of come up with a pretty simple balance here for the energy in the internal wave or in the inshore in the internal tide, if you like. So you can see at any given place, the energy that we have in the water column. Corresponds to the flux divergence, so coming in when it's going off, right? Um, and dissipation, what you dissipate locally. So, if you to first order assume steady state balance, you cancel this, this, this rate of exchange term, then you can say that the flux divergence that we observe is approximately equal to the dissipation that we would expect. That's this DD, right? That steps integrated dissipation. Okay, and we can test this. That's what I've did down here. So the black line that you see here, this scale dissipation loss per square meter, okay? That's integrated dissipation. So the black line that you see here is just the derivative of the black line up here, okay? Assuming this balance. And then I can compare this to my red line, which is my in situ dissipation measurements at all those different moments, okay? 
And you can see that out here, they don't agree all that well, but once you go further inshore, they come closer and closer. And this kind of tells us that a lot of the dissipation that we observe on all each of those moorings seems to be really due to the flux divergence of the incoming internal tides, so really related to the internal tides. And then we can contrast two different situations. Let's work quickly here. I want to contrast this strong certification period here in the beginning, this N2 flux, with a fairly weak certification situation here in the back. So what I've showed before, as I said, it's a whole two months average. But if you look, for instance, at this period here, so the slope becomes way shallower. Okay. So the energy dissipation goes slower. So you can transport more energy closer inshore if you have more certification. On the other hand, if you have quite weak certification, you dissipate much quicker your energy. Okay. That's something interesting to keep in mind. So I was kind of curious how the environmental conditions really set um, uh, or kind of um, force or dictate basically where the energy of the incoming solar tide is going to be dissipated. Uh, that was my question. So I wanted to look at this in terms of certification and in terms of the incoming energy class. Okay, what I do here is um, I correlate the energy I see at each of the moorings. Okay, at each of the moorings to the incoming energy, the energy I measure at what MS100. So this is just a correlation coefficient here. So by definition, at MS100 is one, right? It's just correlated with itself. But you see, if we go inshore, so this correlation decreases more and more and more. Um, so at those deeper moorings, we still see some significant correlation, but then once you go further inshore, the energy we see seems to be completely uncorrelated to what's coming in. That's actually a really surprising fact if you think about it a little bit. So it almost seems that if whatever happens inshore uh, doesn't care about what's coming in offshore. Okay? It's almost as if the internal tide loses memory of its initial strengths while it's shoring. Kind of really surprising. At least it was surprising to me at first. Okay, then let's look at certification real quick as well. Um, if we correlate the energy we see at each of the moorings to the stratification on the shelf, we can see that out here at MS100, there's no correlation whatsoever, right? But further we go inshore, the correlation goes up very strongly. So it really seems that the stratification dictates how much energy makes it on shore, right? To, towards the shallower sites. Um, yeah, okay, that's the two main takeaway points from this slide really that the internal tide loses memory of its initial strengths while it's shorting, and on the other hand, that stratification kind of dictates how much energy makes it through towards the shallower sides. Okay. So, we can think about this a bit conceptually as well. Mm -hmm. So, I put up a uh, this is just my conceptual sketch of an incoming internal wave, right? It has a certain amplitude and comes in with a particular speed. And then if you think about it, it's coming in, the bottom comes up, right? So at some point, its amplitude will be approximately the same order of magnitude like the water does, right? And from there on, if it wants to propagate further, kind of has to, has to lower its amplitude. Which can also be thought of in terms of energy, right? And the amplitude is related to the energy of the incoming moment. Maybe like this. So, for instance, we can look at the available potential energy. So, that's the potential energy of the incoming waves. Mm -hmm. And this is proportional to stratification, the background stratification, and the elongation or the, the amplitude of the internal wave squared. Okay? So that's the energy of the internal. So <clears throat> the curve is also that if you have less stratification, you need a bigger amplitude to facilitate the same amount of energy and vice versa. And if you have more stratification, the amplitude doesn't need to be that big to, to get the same energy. Anyhow, it's just a side note. But what you can do, if you think about it a bit, little bit about the available potential energy, you can 
figure out that there's actually like a maximum, like an upper bound for the for the available potential energy that any given water color could sustain. Okay. And that's if you push all the items up either all the way to the top or all the way to the bottom. Okay. So let's say a maximum amount of available potential that the water color could handle, basically. And it turns out doesn't matter which one you choose, either all the way up or all the way down, you can come up with a maximum capacity of the water column for available potential energy. And this is proportional to the background certification and to the water depths to the sub power Q. Okay. So as it gets shallower, the thing, this upper bound for the energy basically decreases really rapidly. Okay, that's the red line here. So if you think about your wave coming in with a certain amount of energy, okay, um, it will reach this point, which I call saturation point, um, where its energy will be about the same order like the energy of the, of the upper bound of maximum capacity. And if it wants to propagate further from that point, it has to lose energy just in order to be able to make it onto the shelf. Right? And the idea is that it has to lose its energy proportional to this capacity decreasing, basically. Right? That's the idea. So maybe we can use this whole concept uh, to come up with a parameterization of the energy of those internal waves inside this saturated range, right? Beyond the saturation point. And the idea here is that the energy of the internal waves inside the saturated range, that's this here, the parameter, the parameterized available potential energy, it's just proportional to this maximum capacity. Yeah. So the pro proportionality factor, the CAPE, turns out to be based on our measurements about 7%. Okay, 7%, that's, that's the two months mean really, or like a really long term mean. Okay. So um, on average, basically, you see 7% of the maximum energy that you could potentially think of inside the saturated range by this incoming internal waves. Okay. Um, the nice thing about parameterization is it only needs those two inputs. It only needs asymmetry and background certification. With those two things, you can easily measure or get from other sources. So maybe the parameterization gives you a good like Good easy way to come with estimate energy of internal sites in the inner shelf. Okay. And we can use this also to come up with a parameterization for flux as well. If we say that the flux of the internal waves is proportional to its group speed and its energy. Okay. So that since we're in shallow water, we can approximate the group speed approximately with the phase speed. And I'm using just the first approximation here the linear phase speed in shallow water. And I say my incoming energy flux is proportional to the phase speed of the wave and its energy and some proportionality constant. Okay. C flux is my second parameter, three parameters here. That's ought to be 1.2. I wrote in the paper, I wrote a whole section on what this C flux actually implies and what the physics are behind it. I won't go into the details here. Any the main thing is we need another free parameter to kind of be able to parameterize the flux as well. And then you come up with this. And also the flux is just proportional to background certification and h to the fourth power. And then since we already figured out that the relative of the flux and so the flux divergence kind of equals our dissipation, we can also use this to come up with the parameterization for dissipation as well. Okay. So that's just taking the relative of this thing here. That's down here. So we have a really nice parameterization for a really easy parameterization, I should say, for energy, energy flux, and dissipation on the shell. Okay, where we only need asymmetry and certification as input parameters. Okay, you might wonder where the saturation point is here, and you can kind of rearrange this formula to come up with a formula for the saturation point of saturation depths. And turns out in our data set that's approximately 60 plus minus 20 plus minus 20 meters. Okay. So almost all of the moorings that we have lie within the saturated range. Okay, let's look if this parameterization is any good. Okay, let's test it against our data set. 
That's what I do here. So <clears throat> I'm testing for energy, energy flux, and dissipation. And I'm comparing here our parameterization versus the actual measurements. Okay, this is the ratio. So if the thing is one, uh, they agree perfectly. If it's bigger than one, we over predict with our parameterization. If it's smaller than one, we under predict. Okay. And you can see that most of those uh, measurements that we have kind of form this cloud around the the one to one line, okay, which is really really um, encouraging. I should say. But also you see this tail coming out here, okay. And this is mostly measurements from the deepest, most lowering from the MS one hundred, okay. And I should say what's on the X axis. That's some sort of non-dimensional water depth where uh, divide. The saturation water depths with the water depths with the actual water depths of the mooring. So, if this thing is one, we are right at the saturation point, and if it's bigger than one, we are inside the saturated range. Okay, and if it's smaller than one, we are outside of the saturated range. So, you can see once we approach the saturation point, we also approach the one to one line, and everything inside the saturated range fits rather nicely. Okay? So you can really say that our parameterization works surprisingly well, despite its simplicity. And that it's also true for the slack, and to some extent also for dissipation, even though dissipation seems to overpredict a little bit more. Okay. So maybe there's a little bit more going on here that we don't quite understand. Nevertheless, it's mostly within a factor of two. Okay. So it's still really, really good. Okay. Mm -hmm. So now since we have this parameterization, what can we do with it actually? There's lots of different things we can do. For instance, we can come up with whole maps of regions. Okay, for instance, here yeah, this is our experiment where we only need the symmetry, which you can easily get, and some sort of background certification measure. In this case, I just interpolate two different moorings, but you can also just use a single value or whatever you have at hand, basically. And you plug those into your parameterization. You can construct those maps of, for instance, energy flux of the internal wave of the internal types or its dissipation. That's what we see here. And each of those dots is what the mooring actual measurements at the mooring. So you can see that they agree fairly well. Yeah? Not so much for dissipation, which we all predict out here a little bit, but if you go further in short, it works also quite well. But you also can start to learn some of the Physics was not the background. So it's like you see this really low dissipation region down here. And this seems to be kind of okay with the data, even though we don't have really good data over here. And this is due to the fact, for instance, that we have really shallow bottom slope. Okay. Yeah. So if the slope is really weak, we don't see much dissipation in there. And it's just something we expect. So, okay. Um, we have this nice parameterization. Is it is it only good for our data set, or can we actually um, use this also to say something about other data sets? And obviously, it's quite uh, hard to repeat this kind of experiment all over the world. But what I did is um, instead to go through the literature and try to pick up papers that contain some sort of energy measurements of internal types, for instance, energy itself or energy flux or even dissipation. Together with those input parameters that we need, the imagery and certification. Okay. There's a whole bunch of papers I kind of found, and they span quite a wide parameter range, both in terms of incoming energy flux and certification. Okay. Our experiment lies somewhere around here. And then we have different, those different data sets here and different areas. I just want to illustrate like two examples here. Um, for instance, here from South China Sea from Solar Long 2008. I think that's this one. I'm not sure anymore. But anyway, so get some kind of nice measurement where they were measuring dissipation of internal waves across the shell. Okay, so they're going with um, turbulence profilers in the back of the ship across the continental slope. And you could see they're going from 300 meters all the way up to about 50 meters or so. And they're just uh, collecting a bunch of um, turbulence profiler profiles and average them together. And that's what you see here. So you get this cross section across the slope. 
And then you can also vertically integrate those. And that's what we see down here. So that's vertically integrated dissipation. Okay. You see this peak of dissipation around this area, and then it decreases it as you go to the dimension. So okay, that's nice. So we can use our organization here potentially because we have the the asymmetry as well as uh, stratification. We just have this nice plot here where you can see the vertical density pro stratification profile. And just like I'm eyeballing some numbers here and plugging them in stupidly into our parameterization, okay, without tuning any of those parameters. Okay, we just take the same ones that we got from our actual one because we don't know any better at this level. We get this green line here, okay, for dissipation. So it doesn't work at all out here, which is probably out of saturated range. But once once we hit this point, we appear to be inside the saturated range. And our dissipation estimate works really well all the way inside the shell. Okay. So this is kind of surprising, given the fact that it's so simple and we didn't fine tune any of the parameters. So it seems to work really well, actually. So maybe we're onto something here. We can look at a different data set that's um, <laughs> from the shell of uh, New Zealand and then all the on the northern uh, island. And this is quite an old classic data set from Jonathan Charpons, 2001, uh, where they had moorings across the shelf, also from about 300 meters all the way up to 50 meters. <clears throat> so, to test our parameterization again, we need certification and the symmetry. So, we just browse through the tags. I mean, the symmetry we obviously get from that figure here. But we browse through the text and we also find mean square points, which we can see is about this. Okay, it's something to plug in here as well. Then we just stupidly apply our parameterization and we come up with energy numbers. For instance, here 950 joules per square meter at this morning compared to their 500 joules per square meter. Okay, we are a little bit too high, but only with an effect of two still. And the same for this morning here. We get 1,100, we get 2,400. So it seems to work fairly well. I mean, we're a little bit off. It could be probably explained some tuning of this parameter. And also, if you look at dissipation, which they estimate to be this number, 1.5 to minus 2 watts per square meter, our parameterization tells us it should be 3.7. So also uh, not too far off, just like a factor of 2 to 1. Okay? Even though this is quite a different system, it's way deeper, way more energetic weights that are coming Our parameterization still seems to work fairly well. Uh, how much time do we have? One minute. Okay. So, probably I'll skip the other example. We just come straight to um, the summary. Um, so, I kind of showed you that the problems that we said slide that we were looking at. On the inner shelf, really seems to be governed by the internal tide. Okay. Where you can see that if you look at the correlations, that the internal tide appears to lose memory of its initial strength while it's shoaling. Okay. On the other hand, we see that stratification really dictates how much energy makes it onto the shelf okay. or into the shallow region, I should say. Um, we could explain this with this concept of the saturated state of the internal tide. Where the state of saturation for our data set was approximately reached at about 60, 70 meters or so. Um, we could use this to construct this quite powerful yet simple parameterization for energy of the internal type on the shelf. Right. We only need certification and the symmetry as input parameters. And when I was presenting this talk actually a couple of years back at Urgent Science, so uh, quite credible from, from Sandeo told me that he's into service way. Okay? And he told me that afterwards, that this parameterization I came up with is very similar to some kind of parameterization that people use already for a long time on the shelf. Okay? Uh, sorry, for surface waves in the surf zone. Obviously. So it's quite similar to what people were already looking since the 80s for surface waves once they reach the surf zone. Okay? So, and I look at this a bit more detail in the papers, we kind of make a direct comparison. But what comes out is really that we can say, actually, and that's the final point, that the inner shelf appears to be really the surf zone for the internal tide. Okay? 
this kind of pit and sit as a new self definition for the emission. That's all I had to say for today, but also if you want to read more, just have a look at those papers and so published up here in the video in two companion papers. In the first one, we have most of the observation, and the second one, I go into detail of how the current relation works and try to apply it. With this, I'd like to thank you for your attention and hopefully, you still have time for a couple of questions. <laughs>